Greetings, I am Herbert Erbaderb, and today I've got a new locomotive, and you'll never guess what it is, unless you look at the title, I guess. The new Rapido N-Gage Metropolitan Vickers Class 28 Kobo, also known as a Crossley, or a Wonderloaf, which I do find rather amusing. This is a new release from Rapido Trains UK, and as I understand it, there have been some problems with the DCC sound equipped versions of this model. I bought the DC version, or as the box says, silent version, though it isn't silent, it does make noise, just not locomotive sounds, I guess. This one is number D5713 in British Rail Green with the small yellow warning panels, and without that DCC decoder, I'm not anticipating any decoder related problems. Obviously at this point I have already opened the box, I didn't want to do this portion of the video if it didn't run, and when it's brand new in the box, there's a bit of plastic around the model, and the information leaflet is under the foam insert. The leaflet tells us about head code discs, and it says that you can find a list of the different head code combinations on the Rapido website. At the time of recording that isn't true, and you can only find a digital version of this instruction leaflet. I emailed Rapido, and they responded quite quickly, which is always appreciated. They are working on getting that information on their website, and suggested a link with head code information, which I'll share in the description below. I'm sure some of you know that kind of thing by heart, but not everybody does, and there might be better sources of this information out there, but I wouldn't know. It is interesting to learn, but I'm definitely not going to be changing the head codes on my class 28 according to the train it's pulling. I just don't care that much. Anyway, the instruction leaflet does have a nice little diagram showing where the various pipes and cables and stuff should go, which if you are anything like me, you'll find helpful. Without it I would only be guessing. There's also information about DC running, installing a DCC decoder and related functions. There's warranty info and contact info, info about the prototype, and it also mentions the magic wand, which is this thing. This is just a magnet on a stick, and it's used for switching the locomotive's red tail lights off. Here's a baggie full of tiny little bits of plastic. I do like that these extra detailing parts are included, though it is going to be kind of fiddly to put them on, and I will put them on sometime, but not right now. It does already look really good, and it's already quite nicely detailed without those extra bits. As with anything though, I'm not an expert on this kind of thing, so I can't tell you if that exhaust port is 0.5mm out of place or not, or if those hand railings are exactly how they should be. As somebody who's not a rivet counter, what matters to me is that it looks the part, and I don't think anybody can really say that it doesn't look like a class 28, because it does. I'm also not going to open the model up and mess around in there, at least not until I add a DCC decoder anyway but I'm sure there is somebody else out there who does that kind of thing if you're looking for it. Anyway, the Class 28 is, like most British diesels, not a particularly pretty beast. Some might even call it ugly, but I think that's kind of part of its charm. I can definitely see why it might be referred to as the Wonder Loaf. It does have a rather loafy shape to it. I think one of the more interesting things about it is the odd bogies. The locomotive was heavier at one end, so another axle was added to help distribute that weight. I always thought it looked really cool when I saw it in my train books as a kid. The paint job on this is fairly dark, and that's not a bad thing of course, it should be dark, but it can be a little bit hard to see some of the detailing on video, though I did my best to show it. Speaking of the paintwork, it's pretty good, but I did notice a couple of kind of silvery specks here and there. I'm not sure if that's errant silvery paint, or if the paint is chipped and it's silver underneath. This is most noticeable above one of the right windshields, and the central windshield on the other end. It's pretty easy to spot in the video, but these are very small spots and I only noticed them when editing the video, and I didn't see them when I was handling the model. It is kind of a problem, I don't know if it's one that was caused by me, or if it came that way, but it can be dealt with with weathering, so I'm not especially worried about this. Here's a few close up images. I'd say that it mostly looks really good, but when you look very closely it does look a bit model-y. Obviously it is a model. What I mean is things like the window frames look a little bit unconvincing up really close. 
but I don't plan on looking at this with my face up against it, so I think about it with the arm's length rule that I use for other model painting and pretty much all model work that I do. If it looks good at arm's length, I'm happy with it. If it looks good closer, that's good too, but mostly I'm looking at about arm's length, so that's what matters. And this does look good at an arm's length. You can also see that there does seem to be a little bit of overspray of the red at the end of the buffer mountings. The line between the green and yellow at the bottom of the warning panels is a little bit fuzzy too. So it's not perfect, but at arm's length those things are less noticeable, and once it's weathered, it won't really matter. There are of course many good things about this model. The detailing is really nice. The windshield wipers are kind of prominent and maybe a little bit chunky, but they do look pretty good. The railings for the crew to climb up look really nice as well, and these are separate metal pieces. Not separate in that they have to be installed by the end user, but they're not moulded in place, is what I mean. There's also some really nice piping detail under the frame. I find it odd that these are white and orange, but I assume that's what it was like on the underside of the real thing. Maybe it's to help maintenance stuff or something like that. Either way, it stands out, and I think it looks interesting. Also on the underside, you can see there's one traction tyre on each bogey, one per side. This should obviously improve pulling power, but I do wonder if this affects electrical pickup, especially on the four-wheel bogey. It's probably not a big concern, considering how many other wheels there are. Also, mine has body-mounted couplings. I saw that rails of Sheffield had a version for small radius and large radius curves on their side, and I'm assuming the small radius version is the one with the coupling pockets mounted on the bogies. I didn't see that information or a choice for that kind of thing anywhere else, though to be fair I didn't really look very hard. But I think if you're buying one of these, and you've got very tight radius curves, it might be worth thinking about. Anyway, that's probably enough waffling about how it looks in couplings and such. We can all see that it looks nice, but how does it run? Does it run? Well, yes, it does. But straight out of the box it ran like, well, excrement. That's probably an acceptable word for YouTube. The leaflet does say that they test these models for all of 30 seconds, and you do need to run them in. Clean your track, Herbert! I hear you say, and I did clean my track. That is the first thing I did. And it is fair to say that I might have some electrical issues because, well, I'm incompetent, and the power pack I'm using is a very cheap one. It's definitely possible that these things contribute to the initial poor running. As the instructions say though, I ran it in for a couple of hours while I had some lunch and faffed about on my phone and such. Nothing strictly timed or anything like that, I just left it run around the track at various speeds, starting off quite fast because it seemed to run better with more power applied. As time went on I slowed it down and changed directions. Not only the direction it was running, but physically picking up the locomotive and turning it around. I don't know how much that really helps, but why not? As I'd hoped, it started running better and better. I'm obviously not doing any kind of rigorous testing, you'll have to look somewhere else if you want that kind of thing. What matters to me is that it works, and it'll move fairly slowly. I'm not going to flip my lid if it won't do hyper-realistic low-speed crawling, but I do kind of wonder if it would be a better low-speed runner if and when I eventually install a DCC decoder. That's for future Herbert to worry about, and pay for. It's not time yet. But it is probably time to start thinking about what system I would like to go for. Speaking of DCC, it should, I imagine, be easy to turn the lights on and off, in particular the red tail lights. On DC they're always on. That's what the magic wand is for. There's a little magnetic switch in the radiator end of the locomotive. This does only work with the power on, so you can't just turn the lights off and have them stay off. They'll be on again the next time you apply power. That's not the worst thing in the world, and it is a pretty neat little feature. Anyway, after a little bit more than two hours I felt like it was probably running enough, and I had other things to do, so I decided it was time to pull a train. I used my Dapol B set, which I rather like. That isn't something a class 28 would have pulled! Rrr. Maybe I should have coupled the B set around backwards to make it even worse. It works very well as a test train, and at any rate, I'll run whatever trains I like, thank you very much. As I said, the engine doesn't quite creep along, but it runs smooth enough at this speed. 
We'll see if just running in general improves it over time, and in future we'll see if DCC improves it. And because I will be going DCC, I'm not going to spend the money on a better DC controller, though I would kind of like to know if that would help. It does also seem to run a bit better with the radiator end leading, with the three axle bogey, though that may well be my imagination. I did mention the couplings being body mounted earlier, and they do seem to have a reasonable amount of left and right motion to them, so they deal with my corners quite well. I don't know exactly what radius they are, I couldn't be bothered measuring, and they're certainly not the broadest curves, but they're not that tight either, so I'm glad that worked out in my favour. This is the first British diesel I've ever had in model form, and I've never had a real one either, but I think it's pretty exciting. Does it match the rolling stock I've already got? No, probably not really. Do I care about that? No, not particularly. I think it's a cool and interesting locomotive, so I bought it. I understand that Rapido is also working on a class 44 peak, which I'm also quite excited about, and based on this model, I will likely pick one of those up. If you got one of these class 28s yourself, I'd like to hear of your experience. If you got the DC version, did it run poorly and all jerky like mine did at first? Did you have a DCC version with the issues? Let me know in the comments below, along with any other questions or comments you might have. If you've not already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube? You could probably do worse things. If you have the means and you want to help Herbert 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 do Herbert 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 things, and see my videos a bit early before there's any ads, consider becoming a patron. You can find links to Patreon, and all my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. Take care of yourselves, be excellent to each other, and thanks for watching. Farewell.